Our Old Testament reading for this morning comes from the 20th chapter of Exodus. It is the giving of the law, the Ten Commandments as we usually refer to them. Uh, the commandments are often associated with Moses on the mountain, but when they are first spoken, God speaks them to the people of Israel prior to uh, Moses going up Mount Sinai. So let us now listen and hear what the Spirit would speak to us in these words. Then God spoke all these words. <coughs> I am Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, and that could also be translated simply an image, whether it is in the form of anything that is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, Yahweh your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of Yahweh your God, for Yahweh will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to Yahweh your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son, your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and mother so that your days may be long in the land that Yahweh your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male, or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In a world in which less and less people go to church, participate in a religious community, Nonetheless, most people still have heard of the Ten Commandments. They may not be able to name very many of them, but they have heard of them. They have perhaps seen pictures of tablets with Roman numerals on them, or pictures of Moses holding them, and they have likely heard of the court cases over whether or not it is appropriate to display the commandments on public buildings. Now, I have no interest in discussing today the, the proper boundaries of church and state. But I do think that dragging the commandments into our culture wars both trivializes and misunderstands them. I hear people say that it's appropriate to display them on a courthouse wall because, well, the commandments are the basis of our civil law which makes me wonder if these people have actually ever read the commandments. In fact, only a few of them have any connection to laws that we enforce in our society. And our very society is built on sometimes violating other of those commandments. 
24-7 is a, a big catchphrase in our society. Factories stay open 24-7 because it would be inefficient to shut down. Stores and restaurants, some of them stay open 24-7. And those that do generally advertise the fact proudly. And even those who try to keep set still expect that the store and the movies and the gas station and a place to eat will be open for them. We cannot even imagine a society where everyone stopped and rested for 24 straight hours. And if we have subverted the Sabbath with our 24-7 society, well, coveting actually forms one of the, the foundations of our economy. Every day we are bombarded and inundated with advertising, much of it designed to get us to covet. Our economy depends on convincing enough of us that we need more and more that if our neighbor gets something newer or better than our stuff, we should want it. And we should be willing to go into debt and worry about money and work longer hours and get all stressed out so that we can have it. But the fact is that the Ten Commandments are not a set of rules for a well-ordered society. That societies do need laws against murder and stealing and so that justice is based on the truth is so obvious that all sorts of folks have figured this out on their own. Cultures that never had heard of the Ten Commandments had laws against theft and murder and false witness. Now what is distinct about the Ten Commandments is not the inclusion of a few common sense rules. It is the different sort of society envisioned in those other commandments. Like the kingdom that Jesus calls us to be a part of, the Ten Commandments describe an alternative community that is very different from the world in which we live. This radically alternative community is perhaps best seen in those opening few commandments about other gods and idols and the misuse of God's name. These commands do not form the basis of any of our civil laws. Rather, they stand as an alternative to the distorted cultures and societies that we humans construct. God bless America. It's a phrase that politicians speak easily, whether they're from the right or from the left. It was a very popular song during World War II and remains a popular song today. And on the face of it, asking God to bless our nation seems a perfectly appropriate thing to do. And while I certainly hope that God does bless America, I'm also quite sure that in our asking, we frequently violate these opening commandments, perhaps all of them. Now that startles you, I'm not surprised. I think most of us are inclined to think that keeping these first few commandments is not really all that hard. I mean, after all, we don't live in a world with all that many different God options. There's no temple to Baal or Zeus or Artemis down the street that we could go to instead. And and many of us, the only idols we've ever seen are in a museum somewhere. And while granted, the uh, sort of language in our culture has grown a lot coarser in recent years, uh, many of us try not to take God's name in vain. But the fact is that these opening commandments are actually about where our ultimate trust and loyalties lie about who we think is really genuinely in charge. 
In the world where the Ten Commandments were first spoken, these other gods were about hedging bets, about insurance. The, many of the Israelites thought that they could be faithful to Yahweh, that they could worship Yahweh and still offer a little something to the local fertility god just in case, just to make sure that the wheat crop came in. Now, we don't put much stock in fertility gods, but we know all about hedging bets and insurance. Now, for ancient Israel, idols were a part of this, but the prohibition against idols in the Ten Commandments is not just about other gods. The prohibition includes images of any kind, including ones of Yahweh. Yahweh is not like other gods. Yahweh will not be managed and used. Yahweh will not be packaged and brought out on demand. Yahweh is mysterious, unpicturable, undomesticated, wild and free. Israel can only conform to Yahweh, not the other way round. Taking Yahweh's name in vain emphasizes this. Our translation, the one that I read, much more accurately picks up on what the Hebrew actually says. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of Yahweh your God. The issue here has nothing to do with foul language. The issue is about seeking to enlist God in our causes. But Yahweh will not be enlisted. Yahweh will not bless Israel and curse her enemies according to Israel's plans. And neither will God bless America and curse our enemies according to our plans, to suit our plans. Yahweh cannot be enlisted. Rather, Yahweh calls Israel and us to find new life according to God's plan. In the same way, Jesus does not promise to come along with us, to follow along wherever we go, blessing us and making our life better if we believe in Him. Rather, He invites us to follow Him on a way that the world finds foolish, a way of self-giving, of loving the neighbor even when the neighbor is our enemy. Jesus invites us to join him in the way of the cross. Now, I think I've shared something with you before that my wife has posted on the refrigerator at our house. Um, it's a quote that the singer Bono used a few years ago at a Washington, D.C. prayer breakfast. It goes, stop asking God to bless what you are doing. Get involved in what God is doing because it is already blessed. In the Ten Commandments and in the call of Jesus, we are invited into the blessedness that God is already doing. It is not a blessedness that conforms easily to our plans or to our desires. It is a blessedness experienced in Sabbath, in the realization that the world is safely in God's hands and it will not spin out of control if we stop and truly rest, if we disconnect, if we become still and quiet. It is a blessedness that comes in aligning our lives with the ways of God, with God's promised new day, with the hope of a new and restored world, a world that we seek to enact at the table. At the Lord's table, all are invited, the well, the sick, the poor, the stranger, the American, the foreigner, 
every race and family and tribe. At the table, all are one, all are guests, all are welcome. At the table, Jesus is our host, and He does not honor the divisions of the broken world that we construct. At the table, all the boundaries between us and them disappear. This table is the promise. The promise that God will finally not leave the world to our foolishness, nor be drawn into our petty schemes. Instead, God graciously invites us to become a part of something wonderful, new, wonderfully new. To become a part of a new and transformed world coming in Christ. A world governed by love where the Holy Spirit reshapes us so that we become like Christ. Come to the table. Come from east and west, from north and south, from every land and race and culture. Come to the feast. Come and be made one in Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God.